Hello, everyone. Um, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Um, welcome to Observing the Past, Archives, Interpretation, and Practices of Care. I'm Jessica Womack, and I'm a PhD candidate at Princeton University in the Department of Art and Archaeology. Before I begin, I would like to acknowledge that this event is taking place on the unceded lands of Indigenous people. We pay our respects to elders past, present, and emerging. I am pleased to welcome you all here today to what will surely be a wonderful and important conversation. Uh, observing the past brings together curators, archivists, and academics who are committed to practicing care in the interpretation and collection of medical history archives. The panels are organized as a part of RDHX, Visual and Medical Legacies of British Colonialism. RDHX, which I will drop the uh, link to the project in the chat shortly, um, addresses the historical and ongoing entanglements between art, race, and medicine in the spaces of the former former British Empire, specifically Africa, Australia, the Caribbean, New Zealand, South Asia, and the United States from the 16th century onward. On the project site, we have compiled a searchable uh, digital database of objects and images that bring these histories into view. RDHX is led by Dr. Anna Arabenton Kessen, and the research team is composed of research assistants, including Bhavani Srinivas, Sydney Taylor, Phoebe Warren, and myself. To get us started for today, I will introduce Dr. Arabindan Kessen and then introduce each speaker before they offer their individual presentations. First, we will have Dr. Edna Bonhomme, then Dr. Ruth D'Souza, Phoebe Nobles, and Emmy, M, excuse me, Emma Sarconi. After, the panel will come together for conversation. Then we will open it up for questions from the audience. As a note, please use the chat function if you're having any technical issues, and you can place your questions in the Q&A box. Dr. Anna Urbenden Kessen is Assistant Professor of African American and Black Diaspora Art at Princeton University, and jointly appointed in both African American Studies and Art and Archaeology. Her first book, Black Bodies, White Gold, Art, Cotton, and Commerce in the Atlantic World, was, first, was published this month and is now available via Duke University Press. And now to introduce our first speaker for today, uh, Dr. Edna Bonhomme is a historian and writer in Berlin, Germany. She earned her PhD in the history of science from Princeton University and a master's of public health from Columbia University. Her dissertation examined the commercial and geopolitical trajectory of plague and its links to commercial, provincial, and imperial policies in several North African port cities. Dr. Bonhomme's project, Cartographies of Care, is part of her long-term research project that she started in 2019 with a growing collection and archive on the representation of Black health and healing in Germany. So I will uh, turn the mic over to Dr. Bonhomme. Thank you so much. Thank you so much to everyone, um, the organizers, my co-panelists, as well as those who we are not able to see. So caretakers, janitors, sex workers, and disabled folk. Um, I'm really honored to be able to be in this active conversation um, about um, the past archives and, and care. As a historian of science, um, I'm very much interested in thinking actively about uh, the ways in which uh, the history of epidemics shapes our um, ability to access medicine and in some cases how that impacts the extent to which we get sick. This project stems from uh, uh, my current book project which looks at the history of epidemics and how it has impressed upon racialized people who are not only blamed for epidemics but in some cases articulating various degrees of health and illness based off of contagion, containment. So I'll begin with an antidote, which is to say that on the 1st of May, 1850, uh, R.N. Featherston, an enslaver in Mississippi, wrote to Dr. New, a physician who specialized in plantation medicine, asking for advice on how to treat an outbreak of cholera on his plantation. Asking for advice, Dr. New responded to the letter with um, she later published into a modest pamphlet indicating, quote, when a well-marked case of cholera fully developed in all of the characteristics of the disease appears on a plantation, I would like advise the removal of all the well Negroes to remote comfortable buildings, end quote. What he advocated for was a strict quarantine and like the recommendations of the newly created International Sanitary Commission, he opted to isolate the contagion. 
This correspondence was not unique. In fact, various plantation medicine manuals had been published to make account about the health of enslaved Black people during the 19th century. Though the United States had carried off a ceaseless war on Black life, visible and unrelenting, the necessity to keep Black people alive, especially during the cholera epidemic, was predicated on the fact that they still wanted sufficiently healthy labor for their plantations. And while the plantation might be considered a planet without a suitable life support system, hardened by the abject condemnation of enslaved humans, the plantation is a site of terror and it's also the site of resistance. The brutality of the system was not just a US problem, but it extended to the Caribbean. Like the American South, cholera raged the fields. Health was not a policy dictated by the state, but an ill-formed pastiche of remedies and messages that not forgot to the core of ameliorating the life of the formerly and currently enslaved. Cholera was a worldwide problem in the 19th century, transforming itself from a tropical disease to a global pandemic. Although sanitary precautions had been affected in certain cases, they were imposed upon in an unsystematic way that often disregarded the health outcomes of the most vulnerable, that is to say, the enslaved. And during the long 19th century, medicine was an awakening science undergoing reconciliation with ancient practices where midwives, bloodletters, and the curious use new methods to assuage the contagions. Contemporary um, medical pamphlets, as well as um, a rubric for plantation medicine, fashion, healing with very restricted means. So in 1850 in Jamaica, uh, the then, a then British territory also experienced a cholera outbreak where 30,000 people out of a population of 400,000 um, um, got the disease. Although this was a period of post-emancipation in Jamaica, many of the newly freed Black people still labored in brutal plantation-like settings and supplied cotton, sugar, and tobacco to the British Empire. Like the United States, physicians provided treatments um, on in horrifically afflicted uh, plantation sites. Uh, one such physician, Dr. Gavin Milroy, who conducted research in Jamaica, um, hoping to understand the pandemic, um, provided firsthand accounts of what was going on. For enslavers like Featherstone's, slave mortality was principally tied to profitability. Um, for the plantation investments, while for physicians like Dr. New and Dr. Milroy, the practice of caring for the most vulnerable opened broader conversations about contagion and enslavement. Enslavers in the United States and the Caribbean often describe the origins, health, and gender of the enslaved upon their arrival um, to the Americas with invasive examination. For example, Jane Ewells, the planters and the mariners medical companion, one of the authors reports that cholera was one of the most common diseases on the plantation. Priced at $50, which is equivalent to $1,500 today, and dedicated to Thomas Jefferson, the text was a medical advice book for plantation owners to provide direct treatment to the enslaved. These medical pamphlets were for enslavers and it reveals a complicated reality of who is responsible for health, even during a pandemic. The failure of the slave economy to build a robust infrastructure such as regional health boards that could have provided actual equal treatment and medical care was contained in how and who was granted adequate health care and the hierarchy of life. The social medical contract was based on the will of an enslaver and his network, not the greater goal of the public health. And the story of cholera is not only one about this imperial nature of the disease, but how Southern and Caribbean slavery lacked the capacity and will to undo harm amongst those who had been enslaved. So what makes this uh, plantation economy important to understand the study is of med medical interventions during pandemics is to really understand the extent to which Black people were left in and out of the plantation manuals, uh, medical manuals that were constructed. So there was no consensus on how disease spread, but there were racialized perspectives about where the disease originated, as well as um, at the same time, apart from the confinement, uh, African Americans uh, and newly enslaved, uh, newly free people spoke about um, disease. In his autobiography, From Slaves to the Pulpit, Reverend Peter Randolph sketches plantation life. 
It is a text that is conventional slave narrative of the time, highlighting his early childhood, his memories, his kin, and his pathway to freedom. In the 14th chapter of the text, he lists the full names of his friends, carefully marking their initials when known. And he justifies this chapter stating that these are the friends that have been part of the changing scenes of my life. This follows from an earlier point that he made that he who has friends must show himself friendly. He who was enslaved was, uh, he was enslaved with 81 other people by Carter H. Edlow on the Brandon Plantation in the county of Prince George in Virginia. Unlike most of the enslaved, Randolph learned to read and write. And after lamenting about the perils of slavery, he noted in his biography, quote, the cholera came among the slaves and carried many to their rest. The very atmosphere at this time seemed to burn with evil and wrong for the poor Negroes, so that the de death and the best death was their best friend. End quote. So, according to Randolph, death was more appealing than life of enslavement shrouded with gratuitous violence and the conditions of confinement. Another perspective on this relationship between enslavement and disease can be found in another slave narrative by the um, name of uh, Harriet Jacobs and Incidents in the Life of, Sl of a Slave Girl, which was published in 1861. It was one of the few uh, slave narratives written by a woman, black woman, and early on in the text she notes, quote, I was born a slave, but I never knew it until six years of happy childhood had passed away. However, as she noted, she did not live on a distant plantation, but rather in a town which afforded her access to a wider community. And throughout the text, Jacob weaves between her desire to escape and her physical breaking points. When she felt ill, she recalled having chilliness and deathly sickness that came over her. And although she never received a diagnosis for this particular ailment, one thing that she elucidated, like Reverend Randolph, was that during this period of being both enslaved and sick, uh, quote, she prayed to die, but the prayer was not answered, end quote. This sickness had become part of her way of life and for an entire year, she rarely had a day without chills or fevers. Harriet Jacobs also discusses a doctor who owned slaves, complicit in the plantation economy. This physician who was tasked to provide care was an agent that was relegated, that relegated black life as property rather than people worthy of freedom and universal health care. At the same time, enslaved Black women challenge these racial differences by performing their own abortions, delivering children, or making their own herbal remedies. In some cases, enslavers relied on Black women to oversee and provide medical care. Slavery is often a condition that is remembered without giving voice to an enslaved, but as Yogeta Goyal has noted in Runaway Genres, slave narratives provide the tool for formerly enslaved to provide heartbreaking and sentimental appeals for, appeals for abolition. And as the transatlantic slave trade declare, uh, decelerated in the mid 19th century, one major concern of enslavers was the safeguarding black women's reproductive capacities. They were ruthlessly forced to reproduce without uh, their consent, uh, which Dorothy Roberts outlines in Killing uh, the Black Body. Masters would whip enslaved women, but avoid harming the belly during late stage pregnancy. After all, the reproductive health was more important than um, the care that could be provided to Black women. On the surface, segregated spaces might be perceived as uh, petri dishes of disease, but they also function as sites of resistance. Um, and we see that through the corpus of slave narratives that turn captivity on their head, whether one's describing the pull of one's lover or the trajectory of infliction, or even one's escape, uh, these slave narratives give us an opportunity to look beyond the draconian measures of isolation and the legal restrictions of movement and to see what is possible when one becomes free. Enslaved people in the American South and the Caribbean were also challenging their vulnerability to contagion by utilizing their herbal remedies or escaping bondage with little or no access to the biomedical regimes of their enslavers. And despite the harshest conditions, enslaved Africans were able to exercise agency over their bodies uh, through plant medicine, through pine and turpentine um, that offered them some control or agency over their bodies. 
Black scholars have had much to say about Black health and during the um, at Black health and beyond. Um, and to bring it back to Dorothy Robertson's uh, meditation on how racism kills the body, Black body, and Harriet Washington's ex um, expose, Medical Apartheid, which looks at the unequal uh, treatment um, evidenced by the damning and crushing um, issues with uh, plantation economy, we can come to understand um, how remedies and specifically African descended remedies allowed for some relief and survival. The containment of epidemics time and again um, pathologizes Black people, but often if we look into the ways in which people articulated in their own terms what could be possible, um, we could see how um, people move beyond um, these these um, these interments of death. So by way of conclusion, um, one of the things I want to highlight is that humans and microbes live in a constant communion with each other, whether that relationship is antagonistic or beneficial. However, that liaison can sharply change if the microorganism is associated with sex, gender, um, and beyond. Our engagement with epidemics in the modern era, as well as the past, um, it determines how we can be able to deem who is worthy of care. Thank you. Bonham, thank you, Dr. Bonham, thank you so much um, for your remarks. Um, now to, and we'll have time to, of course, um, ask questions and have a conversation at the end of everyone's presentation. Um, so to transition to uh, Dr. D'Souza's uh, talk, um, I'm going to introduce her. Dr. Ruth D'Souza is Vice Chancellor's Fellow at RMIT University in Melbourne, Australia. Based in the School of Art, she's a nurse, academic, and a community-engaged researcher in gender, race, health, and digital technologies. Her fellowship engages health professionals in finding new New ways to understand, co-design, and implement sustainable cultural safety initiatives in a range of health contexts. Dr. D'Souza. Hi everyone, it's uh, 11 o'clock at night here in uh, Melbourne. I'm joining you from the unceded lands of the Boonwurrung people, where I'm an uninvited guest. I pay my respects to elders past and present, and I also want to acknowledge all the Indigenous people that are watching this webinar. I pay tribute to the knowledge, strength, and resilience of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and acknowledge the profound trauma of European invasion. I'd also like to acknowledge that mechanisms for healing and caring for each other's well being in this place go back 80,000 years. Yet, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people face threats to their health and their well being on a daily basis, as seen here in deaths in custody the destruction of sacred country and continuing colonial occupation. Always was, always will be Aboriginal land. I chose the image of uh, a medical missionary attending to a sick African, as it made me reflect on my own experiences of racism, colonization, care and cultures of health. And I'm very, very grateful to Edna for providing such a such a very interesting um, overview, uh, particularly in a time of pandemic when we're all grappling with the enormity of this world event. Um, prior, coming to, prior to coming to Australia, I grew up on the traditional lands of Te Kaurau, uh, Maki in Titarangi, Auckland, New Zealand. And before that, I was born in Tanzania and lived in Kenya in the transition from post-colonial, sorry, from colonial to post-colonial rule and a society imposed by Europe. I speak from a position of disquiet, born into a South Asian community who navigated their own exclusions from whiteness while our position in Africa was under the management and protection of the British Empire. When I was a child in East Africa, which is quite a long time ago, I loved watching documentaries about Livingston and Stanley, the explorers, in fact, I was born in Tabora, the railway town where Stanley found Livingston. And Daktari was another favorite show. It's a Swahili word for doctor. And it was about a vet, Dr. Marsh Tracy, at a fictional study center for animal behavior. And his daughter and staff who protected animals from poachers and local officials, apparently. And inspired by an animal orphanage in Nairobi that I loved to visit. When I look at this image that you can see on the screen, it evokes the white savior complex 
In fact, the white saviour looms large, while the African people wait in anticipation without any acknowledgement that they might have resources and skills incumbent on the beneficence of the great white healer and his God. They stand with full attention but empty hands. I'm reminded of the work of Odette Best, Aboriginal professor at the University of Southern Queensland here in Australia. She shows in her scholarly work how Aboriginal men and women were greatly respected for their healing capabilities by early settlers. For example, settler women preferred Aboriginal women to take care of them during childbirth as opposed to white medical doctors. My nursing profession valorizes biomedicine and is constructed as handmaiden in it. My own work investigates the colonial legacies of health and nursing in the context of migrant maternities. My profession of nursing, excuse me, I'll just grab some water. My profession of nursing is not only an altruistic and caring enterprise, but it's complicit with biomedicine in the advancement of colonialism and imperialism. While the concept of health has in turn lent moral credibility to the colonial enterprise, as Edna showed us earlier. The state links health to its economic and political power, and this has enabled healthcare professionals, especially nurses who comprise the largest group, to control populations through surveillance, normalizing judgments and intervention. The nurse-patient relationship is characterized by espoused virtue and a hierarchy of dependency, featuring a person who bestows and a person who's indebted. In this individualized frame, the gaze is drawn to the interpersonal encounter rather than the community context of health and well-being which is not shown in the image. The white missionary has their ancestor present, but the local people do not. So for me, what this says about nursing is that we need to move away from individualizing, culturalizing and racializing discourses that view care as individual to more collective, relational and critical models that take into account the broader contexts of care. Cultural safety, critical intersectional approaches to care, understandings of power relations are all things that I want to see transform um, my profession. I'm going to um, swiftly hand over to Jessica now so that we've got plenty of time for questions and conversation. Thank you so much, Dr. D'Souza. Um, next, we will have Phoebe Nobles, and I will introduce Phoebe. Phoebe is a term archivist at Mudd Manuscript Library at Princeton University. She's worked at Mudd in several temporary positions since 2016 and is a member of the Inclusive Description Working Group formed in 2019 by the Archival Description and Processing Team in the Special Collections at Princeton University Library. Phoebe, thank you. Thank you. I'm so grateful to be included here today with these other speakers and thanks to Anna Arabend and Kesson and to you, Jessica Womack, for organizing this event. Um, so I am one of the archivists who create and maintain the finding aids that researchers use to discover and access Princeton's archival collections. And collectively, we're known as the archival description and processing team. Um, then the Inclusive Description Working Group is a subgroup of that team made up currently of seven archivists whose names are shown here and it formed in May 2019. Uh, several members of this team had worked with the group Archives for Black Lives in Philadelphia to create its anti-racist description resources. So next slide, please. Our main goal is to describe archival materials with respect for the individuals and communities who create and use them and who are represented in them. And if that sounds extremely basic, we find that right now we need to make a focused effort to think this way, since people working in our field have not always described people respectfully or accurately, and especially not people from marginalized and minoritized groups. We wanna emphasize that reparative work can't be a one-time fix, but needs to become part of archivists' ongoing processes well into the future. Next slide, please. Since I can't describe everything um, or even very much at all of the, uh, what the group has done and intends to do, I'm focusing briefly on an example that just happened to come up for me in the course of my regular descriptive work. 
So this slide shows part of the finding aid for an assembled collection of photographs at the archives called the Historical Photograph Collection Individuals Series. So it's photographs of people who had something to do with the university reaching back to the mid 19th century, including people who are categorized as staff, which series you can see near the bottom left here. In the course of my work, I had just noticed that there were multiple photographs that were labeled, quote, unidentified African-American man, uh, when what was clearly a duplicate photo of that same person was titled with the man's actual name. So all I aimed to do initially was to change unidentified to the man's name, James C. Johnson, which you can see in the next slide. Um, as I looked further, I saw that there are many photographs of James C. Johnson in this collection and attached to his name in most instances was this derogatory nickname, which you can see on the next slide. So this nickname, Jimmy Stink, was certainly pejorative and it was assigned to Johnson by Princeton students. One of our working group's priorities is to aim to describe people in ways that they would describe themselves if we can, though this is not to suggest that I can inhabit Johnson's mind. Um, in many cases, this nickname could have been written on the back of these photographs by someone along the way. It could have been the photographer or some student or alumni, or it could have been a previous librarian or archivist. Um, but this nickname was attached to Johnson's name throughout this finding aid, almost as if it were part of an authority record for his name. Um, it was used as a title, even when a descriptive note would sometimes tell you that something different was inscribed on the back of a particular photograph. So on the next, next slide, please. Um, it turns out there's actually been a fair amount of research about Johnson in the past few years. For instance, work that was connected to the Princeton and Slavery Project, whose website features articles about Johnson. There were um, one of the Princeton slavery, Princeton and slavery plays that came out of that project was centered on Johnson. And probably partly due to the project's work, the archway of a building on campus was named after Johnson in 2019, uh, 2018. This is an image of part of a blog post that a member of MUD's public services staff, April Armstrong wrote together with one of the photos of Johnson from the collection in this case, selling food on campus together with a younger person whose identity we're still not sure of. Um, Johnson was once called James Collins and took the surname Johnson sometime after he escaped enslavement in Maryland um, and assumed something of a new identity in Princeton. He worked for decades in various roles on Princeton's campus starting in 1839. Um, and for someone who was listed at one point as unidentified, there really is a decent amount we can learn about him though none of the record was created by Johnson himself. And of course, there's a lot we cannot know or learn about him. Next slide, please. Um, the next slide shows another image of Johnson from Princeton's collections and another one on the cover of a recent book about Johnson written by Lolita Buckner Innes called The Princeton Fugitive Slave. I can't really cram his story um, into this time. Um, and I'd really encourage you to read this book, which is really worthwhile. But I'll just mention that Dr. Innes um, pointedly noted in a book talk that she gave that many materials at Mud Library that she researched still were labeled with the derogatory nickname. Um, and because of Dr. Innes's book, also as of 2020, James Collins Johnson now does have a Library of Congress name authority record that doesn't include any derogatory name. Next slide. Just to go back to the finding aid, um, I haven't completely erased Jimmy Stink from the finding aid, um, partly because we don't want to hide that Johnson was described this way for so long, and we may not be ready to remove the term completely as a search term, but we don't need to center it as his name. So I've moved the pejorative nickname into an explanatory note, which attempts to briefly contextualize it. Um, the note has actually slightly changed since this slide was made, but this gives you the idea of, of some of the work. Um, I don't pretend, and, I, and no one in our group, I think, pretends that this is a perfect or a permanent solution. Uh, we hope that it's just one part of an ongoing process and a process that's open to suggestion. Part of our group's work is to reach out to other staff and to researchers who can tell us what language they find harmful in our descriptive text. And there's a lot of work to be done here. So I'm leaving off there and passing the screen over to my colleague, Emma Sarconi. Thank you. Thank you so much, Phoebe. Um, so before Emma speaks, I will introduce Emma. Emma Sarconi is the reference 
professional for special collections at Princeton's Firestone Library. As a librarian and book historian, Sarconi seeks to facilitate conversations around the impact of special collections in our lives by providing quality reference services, instruction, design, project management, and event planning. She chairs and co-leads several initiatives, including chairing the RBMS Lieb Exhibition Awards Committee and co-directing the Archival Silences Working Group at Princeton. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Jessica. And thank you so much for um, organizing this event, you and uh, Anna. It's, it's wonderful to be here today and hear from my colleagues. I've really enjoyed all of our previous presentations and I look forward to, to conversing with you all on this important topic. Um, so today uh, I'm going to be talking about issues of authority in the archive as I see as as I see them as a reference librarian. So as Jessica mentioned, I'm the reference librarian for special collections at Princeton. I'm a member of our public services team where my primary responsibility is connecting researchers to our collection via email, an increasing number of Zoom calls and in the reading room. I also, as I mentioned, as was mentioned, organize events and do outreach on behalf of our collections and community. Uh, I am not a cataloger or an archivist. I do not have that training in my background, but we'll be talking about the catalog and the archive today from my point of view in public services. This perspective has been informed by speaking with my archivist colleagues throughout the years, as well as reading the scholarship of archival luminaries, including Michelle Caswell and Dorothy Berry. I would encourage you to seek out those perspectives um, as I give you mine. My with that, my practice as a librarian is overall really guided by the goal of increasing access to our collections. I firmly believe that, as John Overholt, a rare book librarian at Harvard's Houghton Library, stated in his essay, Five Theses on the Future of Special Collections, that everyone is special enough for special collections. I believe that uh, this is true for both those visiting our collections or working with our collections and for those whose narratives are held in our collection. The field, uh, however, is still striving towards a more egalitarian approach in both of these realms. And today I will offer one example of how barriers to access and concepts of authority impact this effort. Uh, so let's talk about authority in the archive and we can, we are on slide two, great. So um, I'd like to bring your attention to the tintype of a woman carrying a medical bag that is featured on the uh, Art and Colonialism database, but is held by the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture, object number uh, 2014.37.14. Uh, moving on to slide three. If you follow the link on the ArtHX website to the source record hosted by the Smithsonian, the metadata for this object on the website lists the subject of this photo as unidentified woman or women and the creator as unidentified. Uh, this, is a seem this seeming dead end is not an unusual scenario for those researching anyone. Um, if you've ever tried to look into the history of a historical figure, you might come into this this scenario, but for those who are particularly interested in the stories of women in collections, and even more so if you are interested in women of color, um, it, be, it is increasingly more common, or it is, it is historically more common, which is why there's much more labor associated with research projects invested in telling these kinds of stories. And I'm happy to sort of elaborate on that on the Q&A if folks are interested. But moving on to slide four, I want to push back a little bit on this concept of her being unidentified. Um, so Phoebe sort of gestured towards the fact that this can sort of happen, that we have information in the archive that is not translated across objects or whatever. But within this object, there is the a caption provided by the Smithsonian that reads, the woman in this occupational tintype is unidentified, but she bears a strong resemblance to Dr. Sarah Logan Frazier, 1850 to 1933. An 1876 graduate of Syracuse University College of Medicine, Frazier became the fourth African-American female doctor in the United States. She was one of the first female doctors to specialize in obstetrics and pediatrics and was a mentor to black midwives throughout her career. So it seems like the descriptive team has a hunch that they can't confirm. Uh, why that they can't confirm that is anyone's guess, but I personally love that they included this information despite the lack of certainty in the archival record. 
All too often, the infrastructure of the archive is approached through a lens of absolute authority. This is the record, the information included is capital T true, and that sort of is is that. Um, calls in the archival community that there's no such thing as a neutral archive or a neutral library have done much to sort of push against this assumption. Archival and catalog records are created by humans who are fallible and biased and products of their time. They have constraints on how much description they can do based on the skills and the knowledge that they have, or even more so the amount of time that they have to write a, write a description. And all of this amounts to the idea that the, the archival record is not gospel and it shouldn't be treated as a static object. I would argue instead that it is a series of facts and perspectives, and sometimes perspectives that think that they're facts, um, that are responding to a moment. That response, however, has lent the legitimacy to certain forms, expressions, et cetera, of knowledge over others, some names over others, and historically, that has been in the interest of upholding white colonial patriarchy. All of that is to say that this caption and its inclusion and its wording is pointing to other possibilities that the researcher can consider. And in that way, it is empowering. That empowerment, however, is somewhat limited because the caption, as great as it is, is not searchable. If, a, if I am a researcher or I am a librarian working on behalf of a researcher interested in finding images or information on Sarah Logan Frazier and I search her name, even that it is written in this, in this caption, because I assume, of the un, I assume the underlying competing structure of the database, I will not get this image in my search results. So moving on to slide five, this is a tragedy on several levels. One being that it is an access and discovery issue. Issues of access are not limited to physical space or outdated reading room policies. They include our discovery portals. This structure makes it difficult for certain researchers to use and access this material. Further, it makes difficult for those who might have the knowledge to change this possible identification into a certain one because they will struggle to find that image at all. It will take a certain amount of effort to know that the question is even being asked in the first place, the question of, of whether this is Sarah or not. The descriptive team had the resources to be able to include the information, which as I mentioned is not always a given, but a whole other problem, but the infrastructure could not support their effort. And this is where I come back to, we come back to authority. How can our archival and library systems better hold the possibilities that our collections embody? How can they welcome collaboration, shun objectivism, and embrace their reality as a non-static responsive system? How can we as a field sustainably, respectfully, and without burdening archivists and catalogs achieve this goal? And more succinctly, is a less authoritative archive even possible? Thank you. Thank you so much, Emma. Um, I would like to welcome back all of our panelists and our uh, moderator, uh, Professor Irvin and Kesson, for our conversation. And I want to also remind the audience that you can feel free to add any questions um, that you have to the chat, and then we will get to those when we get to the Q&A portion of our conversation. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you all. Um, that was absolutely fascinating and um, more than I could have hoped for, actually. I, th I think there's so many rich connections um, and discussions to, that we can, we can take. Um, I was particularly kind of taken with um, a, couple of, a couple of things that I think bring a lot of this together. So, and, Edna put um, put this quite succinctly. And who is worthy of care? And I think, in very many, in very different ways, you've all been um, talking about about exactly that question. And you've also shown us how how these histories and histories of archival creation um, actually very materially shape and inform the physical and philosophical 
experiences of, of health care, um, which is sometimes an oxymoron, um, and, and the practice of, uh, of medicine. Um, I, I think for me, what was sort of uh, that I, I wanted to kind of begin with, though, to start getting at some of these questions was the way that you're all thinking about interpretation. Um, we've, we've seen, I think, in very different ways, how you're all dealing with the sort of the kind of bind of interpretation um, and what I'm what I mean there is that you're often working through forms of misinterpretation in order to in order to resituate yours or our relationship to histories but also to to people um, and to, to the people who've been harmed by these histories and so just as a kind of opening question and also to sort of maybe bring in some more of the personal I, I was wondering if you could each speak a little bit about how these um, experiences of interpretation uh, as, a, as a kind of tool that, that we use, how they've helped you think a little bit more differently or how they've um, helped you think more deeply about care as a, as a practice as, as much as a concept. And feel free to, to jump in whenever you're ready. If other people are shy, I'll go first, but I want to make sure I'm not frozen, like my presentation. Um, you are still frozen a little, Edna. Um, oh, okay. Maybe. maybe I might turn off my video and talk. Can you sure. hear me now better? Yeah, okay. that's great. Yeah. So that's what I'll do. Um, one thing I'll say is that in, in order to kind of answer your question around the experience of interpretation, I would say that um, the very diligent and important work that Ruth kind of um, highlighted to us of naming where we are and naming who we are is so relevant. The ways we move in and out of privilege, the lands that we find ourselves in, um, and also just, you know, how do we reckon with that, not just in a rhetorical sense, but also in how we um, conduct our actions and our politics and the study and the research that we're doing. So I would say on, on my end as a descendant of slaves, but also as someone who unfortunately was born on similar land in occupied, that is occupied by the United States, um, that I'm also aware of um, trying to as best as possible highlight the story of the oppressed, um, reading against the grain and, and very much paying homage to the subaltern studies, uh, while also being open to um, new modes and new ways, new ways of thinking. Um, so I think that in some ways that experience of interpretation is really allowing um, oneself to be proactive um, in self-reflection without navel gazing, of course, while also making room um, for, uh, uh, and making room and space for uh, reinterpreting the archives. And so um, I'm, I, I just wanna like uh, point that out just to say that I, I'm really uh, impressed by the work that people are doing and that there is that proactive um, reflection on the part of, of, of Emma, of, of Ruth and, and Phoebe. So just wanted to open up with that. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, one of the things, um, that I really liked about what you said, Edna, was just um, that opportunity to be reflexive. And what, one of the things that I've been very uh, embedded in has been um, the idea of cultural safety, which uh, was developed by Indigenous Māori nurses in Aotearoa, New Zealand. And a fundamental tenet of that is that capacity to problematize one's location and positioning um, and specifically kind of look at um, what one's positioning does, what one's um, what oneself carries as a culture bearer because we're all culture bearers but specifically the culture of healthcare and, and I'm thinking about um, the fields in which Phoebe, Emma and Edna work in as well, and of course you, Jessica and Anna. Um, in terms of 
I, I, I think it's quite difficult to be reflexive on your own and more and more I'm coming to the idea that we, we can be reflexive when we're challenged by the other, whoever the other is. And I think specifically uh, the other who has less positional power than we do. Um, and I'm kind of wondering how we can have those kind of collective conversations that facilitate um, this kind of awareness. Um, and I guess in all of this, how we can do it in ways that um, hold us accountable um, for how we conduct what it is that we do. So I'm just thinking of nurses um, I've been trying to find different ways using artistic and creative methods. Um, so, you know, um, colleagues who are involved in theatre of the oppressed, for example, you know, working with students and so on. And, and I know I'm moving away a little bit from what we're talking about, but, but to further open up what Edna has been um, talking about, you know, um, against the grain, I think, is also about... Um, having really difficult conversations and a space for them uh, and the capacity to hold our own fear, anxiety, our desire to fix things and manage things and control things, you know, and be with that uncertainty and discomfort that might be present. One of the things just to um, talk a little bit about looking at the art and colonialism database on art HX that um, when I think about interpretation of care, one thing that I admired there is the sort of, if you saw on the slide that Ruth showed and that Emma showed, there are, as part of the project, there was, um, there's this there's this captioning under each image. And I think both Emma and I had this instinct probably to to leap from Art HX straight to that institution where um, that holds that object and find the different ways in which the, the image might be described. And um, when I talked to Jessica the other day, she talked about these um, the captions there being almost like a form of, of alt text that would normally sort of be um, on the web, like behind the picture, but um, but here are visible. But one thing that occurs to me looking at them is um, is just the the care with which you can see the the person who wrote it, and I think many of them were were students working on the project. If I'm not all of them, yeah, all of them. Um, you can just you can just observe the um, the careful process of looking that made those. Um, that made those captions. And they're sort of, when you sometimes contrast them to alternative, like one I noticed, it just sort of sort of carefully lays out, you know, here's a portrait of a woman um, named Elizabeth, I'm gonna not remember her last name, but um, wearing a blue and white dress. And then wherever it is, it's at, at the Smithsonian or at the British Museum or somewhere, it will say like, she's in Federalist costume. And it's just this very um, different kind of approach and, you know, one, might be useful, but um, but it takes time and it takes care to um, to just to just look and and patiently observe and and write that kind of description. Phoebe, is that less about time, but a way of being in the world and a way of thinking? Because I kind of think that sometimes we can say, "Oh, it, it's about time," and and I and sorry, I keep deferring to being a health professional, but. You know, the, the excuse for not caring is always like, we've got so much pressure, we've got to make decisions really quickly. Um, but is it about a kind of commitment to doing things in a particular way that, um, you know, isn't isn't time dependent? Yes, that sounds right to me. Um, though I feel that it also, that that whole perspective will lead you to be able to commit time and labor. were you gonna sorry I, I don't want to I don't want to I was just I was just questions. gonna sort of um think about this this problem of interpretation I've been thinking a lot about 
um, and I sort of gestured gestured towards this in my presentation about um, about sort of the ecosystem of the archive. Um, you know, I am sort of positioned in my in my role between between our sort of back of house folks, our archivists, our curators, and then our researchers. Um, we're sort of public services is sort of that frontline staff. And um, and there's so much work that is happening, interpretive work that is happening on the part of the researcher um, that we as professionals, as the people who uphold these systems um, don't hear about and don't get to integrate into those systems. We don't even have the opportunity to sort of consider it. Um, and, and, and I think that might, I think that might be a real problem because when you're talking about um, when you're trying to make a more just archive, when you're trying to make a more inclusive space that benefit, you know, that speaks to as many possibilities as possible, right? Like you no know, one database is going to be able to, as it currently envisioned, and I don't want to sort of cut off the possibility for some sort of imagine, amazing future, but like as it stands right now, our systems could never hold the complexity that is humanity that exists in our in our space, in our collections. Obviously it is biased towards one kind of, uh, one kind of experience over another, but like one document is just, it contains so many multitudes that it's gonna be difficult to find as many discovery portals to accessing it as, as it truly holds. But we, but there are people who are doing work to, to flesh that out. And we don't support that. We don't sort of, allow for that symbiosis, that idea that we are all sort of working with on it. I don't want to say a team, but we're all sort of swimming in the same water. And we all take care of these documents in different ways, but we're not speaking to each other enough about what that looks like. And I don't feel like I'm, I'm, I don't feel like I learn enough from my patrons about my collection. And that's not because I'm not having conversations with them. It's because we're just not in touch enough. And I don't really know what the solution is, but I think that is a metric of care. It's a way of caring for, you know, my my patronage. It's a way for of caring for my collection. It's a way of respecting the um, the humanity that is in our documents. It's a way of respecting the people who are created them and who are represented in them. Um, but can the archive ever encompass encompass a human? I don't know if that's I don't know if that's attainable. That's a, it's an interesting point, Emma, because as Ruth was talking about, you know, th this question of, of how do we facilitate these sorts of encounters in the sense that you were saying, and to sort of um, the encounters that might bring about these kinds of shifts. I was also, I was thinking, you know, how does that what what are those encounters for someone working with with archives and um, but also um, I think you know working particularly working on material like like the material that we have in Art HX this very it's a very traumatic history but it's also a history that's still very much present because it's you know it's informed healthcare as you know both Edna and Ruth pointed out. Um, and so I wondered to, I've, I've been thinking too about how, how these kinds of encounters between, um, archivists and scholars and, and practitioners, you know, how they are also kind of perhaps, perhaps Ruth, that, that might be one way of facilitating some of these conversations. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I was also trained by Māori nurses um, in cultural safety. And I mean, I, th I think that I, I've increasingly been coming back to some of those conversations um, recently. And I mean, I think all, all of you are also talking about um, relationality and, and, and positions um, in, you know, in really important ways too. Um, and so, I mean, I, I, want, I want to just open, I, the the floor because I thought that there might be there might be things that you were seeing in each other's presentations um, 
that resonated with your own your own position your own work that you might want to highlight so i'm gonna let you speak to each other yeah i'd actually i'd like to um bring up something that ruth said about complicity and and um when you were talking ruth about struggling with like being complicit in in the system of healthcare, um that really resonated with me because i struggle with being complicit in in my own system and i was wondering if we could all speak a little bit about how um complicity and attempting to care or practices of care um, intersect and push against one another. Maybe Ruth, you can sort of expand upon your, your thoughts on complicity. Yeah, well, um, one of the things that I'm really interested in is um, how we have the most tender hearted, sweet, kind, lovely people that become health professionals. And then something happens in the process of working in institutions where that kindness gets eroded and people get burnt out and exhausted. And, um, you know, one of the things that's kind of emblematic of, of health systems, particularly in settler societies, because that's what I'm most familiar with, um, but also in the UK where I've worked, um, is this kind of what someone has described as callous disregard. So, you know, how do we go from um, caring deeply for the integrity of uh, humans and um, respect that you've been talking about, you know, that, that marks how you treat humans in the archive, you know, um, how, how can we hold that um, when we work in systems that are very bruising and are struggling under all kinds of, um, you know, imperatives to deliver, deliver things that are kind of unattainable, you know, if we really want to keep treating people as humans and maintain tenderheartedness. So, you know, that, that's something that I've, I've struggled with you know, as a health professional and then at, at universities. And I kind of think, um, you know, care, which comes from curate, as you all know, um, you know, I, I kind of think we, we, we're challenged, aren't we, to somehow um, care for ourselves and for others in these kinds of quite bruising, challenging environments, you know. Uh, and so for me, it's it's about um, how can I sustain myself, and I keep going back to co working collectively with people, you know, and nurturing each other, and um, trying to identify what our values are, and trying to, um, you know, support each other to do that kind of work. Yeah. I'm not sure. Yes. So, and, and then also in terms of the complicity question, I think it's, um, you know, nurses in particular, our, our job is to kind of keep our heads down and keep systems going. And because we're so busy doing busy work, we don't always ask on what basis that work is being done and um, who gets good care, you know? So I think that's all part of it and and this evening actually I was listening to uh, a talk by Lauren Ballant you know and thinking very much about um, you know who who gets to be cared for you know who gets to be nurtured and and how that happens you know and and amidst these very glaring inequities that we're all aware of yeah sorry that was a ramble but <laughs> No, that was great. Thank you. And then, and then I was, I, I'm also thinking of, um, you know, Edna's work and uh, thinking about the kind of messaging and, uh, you know, who, who gets to uh, receive messages about health and care in ways that are relevant to their context, you know. Um, so just reflecting on, on Edna's talk as well. 
So I, I'll intervene as well, but I don't think I'll turn my video off because my connect my internet connection is not so good. But I think one of the things that I I feel has been very important for me in terms of this this question that you bring up, um, Emma, regarding complicity and care, especially within institutions, is um, very much for myself thinking about Audre Lorde's work uh, and and her kind of praxis of care vis-a-vis -vis her cancer journals, um, where it was during this very dark period of having to deal with her morbidity and, and really face that um, from head on um, and, and trying to reckon with that, that physical pain and, and documenting that um, with friends, with a community of people um, that she was able to theorize for herself what care could mean, not just on an individual basis, but also through a community um, community informed uh, feminist praxis. Um, and I, I think it, in some ways it matters in so far that um, it, it's through that struggle um, and it's, it's through an embodied struggle that often uh, we can come to know and we can come to do uh, the collective work that uh, Ruth has, has brought up. Um, and with, with institutions, uh, in some ways, there's, there's not really a blueprint. Um, I feel like it, depending on which institution people are, are at, especially um, how, given how so many institutions um, that have um, wealth have, have been able to do so through some form of exploitation, you know, whether it's, you know, obviously with Princeton um, being uh, on indigenous land, but also um, the ways in which you know, some of the dorms had what were slave quarters. <laughs> and, and you know that um, through your work, both you know, Phoebe and Emma, and uh, obviously Anna and, and Jessica, and, and you know, just the, thinking about how the architect, even the architecture of institutions is predicated on this, um, this imbalance of power of wealth, um, what, what, what I think has been exciting, yet nevertheless, even at a place like Princeton is that, students have been able to organize, faculty members have been able to organize to challenge some of that and the renaming of this um, public policy school to you know, having the Department of African-American Studies be a department, <laughs> all of which I think um, are ways in which institutional change can help to really enliven the moment and really speak to the moment um, so that the complicity that you speak of, Emma, can can be shaken up a bit. So, um, I think that the the yeah, even at the institution like Princeton, that there has been um, in recent histories a way to allow for more thorough, reflective, and collective change because of the activism that has been happening. Um, but that um, some of those changes aren't enough, of course, and 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 but even just being able to like ask the questions is one of the first steps uh, to hopefully um, approaching the archives and approaching what is being done at these institutions with some form of care. Um, I'll, I'll stop there. <laughs> Thank you so much. I mean, I think, yeah, we, we, Princeton has an amazing activist student body that I'm constantly in awe of. Um, and they've done great work and so much of the university moving, I feel like the way that it has has been because of that um, student activism, which is which is wonderful. It gives me hope, the, stu the students give me hope every day. They're, they're incredible. Phoebe, do you have anything you wanna say on complicity? Um. <laughs> it happens. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think it's a question that we all need to sit with, really. Um, not just the not just the panelists. Um, I'm just aware of the time. I just wanted to. I, I don't want to disrupt the discussion, but I. Um, I wondered, Jessica, did, if you had anything that you wanted to ask. Um. I do. I, yeah, just to thank you all so much. I mean, um, for sharing your thoughts and and your practice. And I mean, I my question is sort of it's been it's informed by everything that you all have said, and I think you all have sort of answered it. But I wondered if we could just talk about this like 
very explicitly, a practice of care is being informed by an, an ethics of care. And, and I'm, I'm wondering what the stakes are of care for you all um, and how have you developed your own ethics of care and in what ways were you practicing you know, care and how has, has your, your own approach to your, and the way that you're thinking about ethics um, shifted potentially throughout kind of your own um, careers and, and different practices. I'll jump in if, if, um, if everyone's still collecting their thoughts. I think that um, this question of the stakes is like is important to me because, um, you know, as I said, I'm guided by this idea that everybody yeah. is worthy of of so the special of access and special collections and representation in special collections and. Um, you know, reading the work of of Michelle Caswell, um, an archivist and scholar at UCLA, um, she wrote a she's written several essays about the sort of ramifications of going to a place like an archive, um, which is you know supposed to be the place of record, as I mentioned. You know, the place of hit. This is where the history is, um, and not seeing yourself and what that can do for people. Um, you know, not just our students, but you know any sort of any sort of scholar, any sort of researcher um, who is looking for themselves in the archive and they don't find them. And, uh, you know, even as a white woman, you know, when I don't see other women in a space, it's, it's, it's demoralizing. Uh, you know, the United States has never had a female president. There is, that is a, that is a ceiling, right? And it, and it says to you, that you don't belong there. And what is what are the stakes of, of saying you don't belong in the annals of history? You don't belong. Princeton doesn't consider you important enough to keep your records. That's an incredibly, incredibly terrible thing, message to send to anybody. Um, and I think it helps perpetuate this idea that there are some people who are more important than others based on you know, a system that has been decided on by a certain group of people. Um, you know, I work with documenting women's ownership markings in the front of our rare books. I'm doing an inventory and, um, and I get so angry going through and finding these women's names and seeing that they haven't been, they haven't even been mentioned in our catalog. We'll have, you know, a record that will have a, a beautiful and very well-researched note on what the binding is like for the book and there isn't even a note telling you that this woman owned this book and her name is in the front of it because she didn't matter and for me you know people matter and by needs matter too right like i'm not going to say by needs don't matter but but people matter and and they matter then they mattered then and they mattered now and how can we how can we honor that? And that's what I try and that is that is my ethics of care in the archive. How do how can we make people know that they matter and tell them that they matter? I think sometimes when I think about the word care in the context of our work, it's most often comes up as collections care. And I actually in my work do a lot of physical care of the objects. And um, so one of my projects recently was just to help prepare um, med library materials to move out of the building and to make them be able to move back in. And so it's really a lot of, um, of physical, like um, will this box hold this object? Can it, can it move? And, and there's really a lot of, um, of effort and, and, and care of um, materials and, um, there's less conversation about, there, there are, are ways in which, you know, um, I, I know the profession is is more and more broadening and, and that access, like Emma talked about, is, is very important to people broadly, but there's just less um, talk about care, to my knowledge, um, for people. Yeah. 
Um, for me, I think where, where I'm at at the moment is really thinking about intergenerational kinds of um, legacies and conversations and nurturing and yeah, you know, it must be, you know, when you hit that jubilee mark that it happens <laughs> and and just thinking like, you know, I'm not going to be around forever. So what do I want to leave behind? And, uh, you know, how do I nurture future generations? And I guess for me, that's also about um, teaching, but having intergenerational friendships, relationships and connections. Um and um, which kind of relates to something Edna said about just, you know, continuing to stay open and receive feedback and be learning, you know. So I think that's one of the ways that, that I think I practice care is to nurture and support um, generations behind me, in front of me, around me. Mm. Um, I'm also going to intervene to turn off my video. Um... I would say for me, the the ethics and practice of care is, is, is quite difficult in some ways. And I think that I've gone through different phases of not providing care for myself because in many ways, the, the discipline of practicing science um, at one point and also even history and graduate school is predicated on a kind of neoliberalization of the self because we're highly encouraged to be as productive as possible. And then that gets in turn um, put into the ways in which we approach, or at least in my case, approach um, knowledge information. And it's it's in many ways um, moving to Europe where people actually have paid vacation and holidays that I've, I've really learned to slow down and to really do the work of um, attending to uh, careful reading, attending to collective grieving, and attending to uh, just having the chance to to deeply engage with um, the works of, of people who've, who've done and written um, beautiful essays and, and, and memoirs, whether it's Anne Boyer's The Undying, which is a cancer patient memoir of sorts, and really thinking actively at the intersections of the of, of what it means to have cancer and to reckon with um, how the US medical system does not help with that to, um, you know, even just like recently reading Annette Gordon-Reed's work and thinking about the neglected origin stories of black Americans, what that comes with, uh, to um, Claudia Rankin's work uh, uh, as a poet and scholar, her, her, her work has really been inspirational for me to, to actively think about, um, uh, what is America and, and Jasmine Ward's uh, essay last year around um, losing her, her partner um, has been also quite illuminative. So in some ways the ethics of care for me and the practice has also meant just like slowing down, reflecting and, and, and doing the careful work of uh, engaging with people who's, who've been able to, to, to really meditate on what it means to be and exist in this world, um, while also um, navigating through and weaving through stories that uh, haven't been able to always be um, reflected in, in popular or mainstream uh, media. And so uh, in some ways the ethics of care um, is an ongoing kind of um, battle for me to figure out on my, with my own praxis, um, but it's also something that, that comes with um, trying to work through um, the limitations of time um, and space. And, and I really like what Ruth had to say, this intergenerational thing uh, is, is also so important. And, and for people like myself, where my ancestors don't really have any documents beyond the ones that um, exist when they migrated to the United States um, during the 70s and 80s, I'm trying to find archives within my family by just talking to my elders, um, as painful as that can be, and as fragmented as it can be between Haitian Creole and French and English, um, that human archive the, that I, I can get from my relatives has been so pivotal for me to understand um, my own kind of family history, even when uh, we don't have physical archives, textual archives to put us in, um, in certain uh, histories. I'll end there. 
Thank you all. That was really beautiful. Um, oh, sorry, Jessica, did I talk over you? No, I just was going to say thank you all so much. And, and I just wanted to also say, I mean, it sounds like across all of you, you know, we're really talking about how this is um, your, your ethics and practice of care are so connected to your ways of being in the world and how that is, of course, dynamic. And, and I think connected to earlier um, conversations about the archive, you know, in what ways could acknowledging the dynamism of our own beings and beings in the world impact the way that archives are constructed or change over time to allow for, um, you know, different stories to, to kind of come to the fore. So anyway, yeah, that's just what I was going to say. Thank you. Yeah, it's it was really amazing. Um, I mean, I, most people know I used to be a nurse and one of the, the things I've been really struck by um, in the course of doing this new project and listening to you is also the similarities between how archives function, you know, and how bodies function in these different spaces as archives of their own. Um, and, you know, the ways that in different ways, archives and bodies become these sites of extraction. Um, and, and I think, um, for, for me working, kind of between those different fields has, has also meant you know, having to think about as a scholar how my own practices reinforce or how they rub up against and, and can change that. But I, th I think as Jessica pointed out and as you've all really highlighted, so much of this is about a particular orientation um, and, and understanding and understanding these, um, these bodies of... Uh, or repositories as, as not merely repositories, right? There's something far more holistic and, and dynamic and um, and relational. And so uh, I really thank you again um, for, for this conversation. There are two questions in the Q&A that I think um, t take us back to some of these um, these understandings of, of what an archive can be. Um, and so I'm gonna just um, read them out and then maybe um, if one or two of you want to want to respond we can do that and then we'll we'll um, close the panel because I I, I don't want to keep you longer than you need to be we all need to be careful and, and restful right now so the first question is from my colleague um, hello Basile um, and he asks I was wondering how how there are ways for archivists and librarians to integrate new ways of thinking um, about archival and iconographical material through the lens of critical fabulation um, as theorized by Saidiya Hartman. Does anyone want to take on that question? Um, I can say that we've, t we've talked about this in the Archival Silences Working Group at Princeton. We um, started our, our working group actually by reading Sadia Hartman's essay. And I think this is a really tricky question because, um, you know, as I mentioned, like the archive is supposed to represent, you know, the, the facts of a document and, um, and critical, critical fabulation sort of invites you to consider those facts, consider beyond those facts. Um, and so, uh, I would leave it to archivists to talk more about that, but I know that they I know that they have, and so I would I would leave it to the archival community to sort of consider what the boundaries of um, critical fabulation could be in archival description. I think it's a really tricky question. Um, I guess I would say that uh, I. I'm in great admiration of Sadia Hartman's work, and I would say that uh, you know what's so brilliant about it is um, you know what the word, the power of her, um, her ability to kind of evoke um, concretely um, what personal connection she has to archives, ones that are missing, ones that are present, as well as her kind of intellectual journey and the ways we can. Can think with her, um, and and there's one particular quote um, that I want to um, kind of take from her um, her text "Lose Your Mother: A Journey Along the Atlantic Slave Route," where she says, "quote quote To read the archive is to enter a mortuary, 
It permits one final viewing and allows for a last glimpse of persons about to disappear into the slave hold. Um, and I think that you know this links to the, the kind of presentation I provided, which is really to, to think about these people who I have not met, um, who were enslaved and found themselves um, at one point in their life um, uh, being emancipated and really documenting that um, to document the horrors uh, of the institutions that didn't allow them to realize their full potential in humanity and, and to do so um, in a way that they could kind of, um, you know, really sh um, shake up uh, the, that institution full, full, full blown, but it was also in a way that the slave narrative in itself became and has become, um, in my reading of it, um, an archive from, from the oppressed as opposed to the plantation manuals that try to only really have the enslavers' interests in mind, and and really working with those complications um, of the enslaver and the enslaved, uh, especially in the realm of medicine, um, allows me to to look beyond in some ways that that kind of space of death, and obviously social death, to one where um, people can exercise their mode of escape, their mode of freedom, their mode of um, of being, um, especially given that. Um, at least the cataloging of some of these archives don't even provide the full names of, of, the, of, the, of the people who um, were descendants of slaves or, um, or in some cases even might have been doctors. And I, and I, I just uh, think it's so, so important to, to not only um, work against the archive and to really see what, what is missing, but also to, to find the sources in which um, people have been able to also speak for themselves. So I'll end there. Thank you. And maybe that's also um, going back to Emma's earlier point about ways that um, researchers and archivists and, you know, librarians maybe need to work, be kind of coming together a little more or be, a be able to be in conversation around these objects um, a little more. Um, because, yeah, I, I agree with everything you just said, Edna. Um, in, in, uh, as a researcher, that, that kind of possibility that um, ideas work allows is really quite um radical so um i'm just i'm going to move to the next question which is from julie melby um oh before i do someone has just said if it's possible to draw up a list of authors and titles so i think what we might do is ask the panelists um to maybe send us some of the the references that they've used and we can put that up on the art hx website um and I think we've got the link to that in the chat. Um, so Julie asks, especially in a time when we're attempting to recognize indigenous communities, why do Princeton and other university databases refuse to include nationality or geographic origin in our authorship listings? We can study Indian medicine, but we can't search British artists held at Princeton. I mean, I think that's that's a question for uh, somebody who knows a lot more about cataloging than I do. <laughs> like that that's uh, that's a met that I think is a metadata issue, uh, to be honest. Um, and so I I don't really have the expertise to speak to uh, to why our systems specifically don't support that kind of searchability. I don't know, Phoebe, you have any insight on on this question. I don't really have insight to add there, but and I just will say that, um, like Emma was saying earlier, like we can, well, I, I don't know if this is an intractable issue that Julie's bringing up, but, but we can change some of these things. And just one, um, you know, it's it sort of is small, but one initiative of our group is to, um, that we through, so on every finding aid, there is this thing at the bottom suggest a correction and it's um, it's been there for years and it's been it's sort of at first highlighted um, like if you find a spelling error if you think some dates are wrong and now um, 
it does specifically, I, I think it's odd in a way to conflate these, these things, but, um, but it does um, link out to our statement on archival language that the group has written. And so it includes an explicit call to researchers to say, if you find harmful or offensive language, or if you're finding something that is missing, um, please get in touch. And there, um, uh, you know, we're hoping that use of that, that, that sort of understanding that, um, that there's a conversation to be had um, really becomes more, more known and more public and, and used. And we had like a very fruitful, um, for instance, you know, one researcher who wrote an article about a woman who's represented in our collections she was previously represented as having what was called a special interest in mycology, um, and she was a scientist. And so, when the um, the person who's written about her, you know, was able to send on the information so that she can now be described in her biographical note as someone who was a, a botanist, um, a, a taxonomist, and we can list her publications. Um, and that's just a, a you know one fruitful use of that that we're hoping will increase. Um, okay, well, thank you. Thanks, Phoebe, for responding to that. And um, I have kept our panelists on for longer than I, I promised I would. So I'm going to say thank you um, very much to you all for your really thought provoking very, very caring and careful presentations. Um, I really look forward to continuing the conversation. Thank you to our audience for joining us. Um, have a lovely day, afternoon, evening, um, wherever you are. Um, and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And I hope you Thank you.